94 days. I have many times in my life gone off to a cabin and been perfectly happy, not seeing another person for days and sometimes weeks on end. I really do love solitude. So those two things aren't necessarily opposite. Yeah. I just want to say for the record, yeah, I'm going to plant th- my flag in the solitary extrovert. Or partying hermit, <laughs> Where, whatever. <laughs> Let's stop with the labels. Here's the thing about introverts and extroverts. I think they're very useful to discuss, and I'm super, super excited that we're going to talk to Susan Cain a little bit later after we read this letter, which is about introversion and extroversion and those two personality types trying to mesh, right? But I think that those labels can be leveling. And mm-hmm. the truth of the matter is that within an extroverted personality like yours or mine, there's a little space that needs solitude or maybe even a big space Mm -hmm. but we sort of say well an extrovert's the life of a party and they never want to be off stage and introverts never want to be on stage and that's actually it's a lot more nuanced than that as human things tend to be but i am actually married to somebody who i do think is an introvert i think she is yeah and i think we we need it because we're such just raging narcissists okay (laughs) obviously or at least blabbermouths or or blabbermouths But, you know, we have had to negotiate that. And what people oftentimes don't realize is for introverts, it takes a lot more energy to be in a social setting. For us, we are, even though I think we crash later, we're energized by being in social situations. We're energized by the attention, the energy that's exchanged. We get all hyped up and we dig it. For an introvert, even the act of stepping into a social situation can be incredibly draining. Right. But, you know, I really do dispute this idea that extroverts are raging narcissists. I mean, I think No, that's just us. I think that narcissists, to be a narcissist is something different than being social or verbal or energized by group situations. I think that you can be an absolute narcissist and be the the shyest person on the planet. You know, those things don't go hand in hand. I'm just going to tell you. Yeah, you know, we're going to talk to Susan Cain later. She's going to back me up on this. I think She's going to school me. But, you know, for me and Brian, it's interesting because, you know, he is absolutely quieter than me. And it's never been a conflict. I, I will say the only time it's come up with us as a couple is sometimes we're in a group situation and I'll wish that he talked a little bit more. You know, I'm willing to cede that space. It's not like I'll just talk and talk. I will talk and talk, but I love to listen. Mm-hmm. And what I know about Brian is when you do get to know him, he is so fun and so interesting and he's a great conversationalist. And sometimes it just takes him a little longer to warm up right, to that. Right, right. This is the experience I have with Aaron is that people initially, you know, if we're in a social situation, you know, I'll be blabbing away and trying to crack wise and all that stuff. And fairly quickly, most people are like, yeah, we kind of get your neurotic, loudmouth Jewish thing. <laughs> but then they're very quickly, they're kind of like, aaron has got this calm energy. She's good at listening. She's very funny and witty, but it takes a little longer to get to that and it's not as needy in a certain way right and almost inevitably people are like we love your wife could you just send her to the next party i get that a lot with brian too <laughs> they're always like your husband is so great and That's he right. is great it's almost like there's a little I'm hint like, of like yeah. your husband's so great <laughs> that he's greater than you but yeah. we're not going to say that he's but he's just really great all right we got to get to this okay letter. so I'm here's so the letter excited. it's a really interesting letter to me um so here it goes Dear Sugars, in three months, I will marry a handsome, loving, and compassionate man who happens to be the love of my life. He's smart and funny and makes me crazy happy, except for one difference that has been a challenge between us from the start. We have vastly different social dispositions. I'm extroverted, and although I love some good alone time, I crave social interaction. Making connections with other people is a balm for my soul and one of the major things that helps stave off depression, which has fortunately been kept at bay for a while now, but lurks in the shadowy corners. I have many friends who I enjoy spending time with, both in small gatherings and large groups. I'm an only child, so my very closest friends are like sisters to me. I have no qualms about attending events where I don't know anyone. I'll simply start introducing myself, hoping to find a new friend in the crowd. My love is introverted and shy around people he doesn't know well, He vastly prefers staying home with Netflix and a good book. I know he has some anxieties around being in large crowds and conversing with people he's not friendly with. It is very, very uncomfortable for him. He has a group of close friends he's known since childhood and some work colleagues he's close to, but no new friends he's really connected with as an adult. 
Many of those childhood friends have moved out of state in the last couple of years. This has become a big issue for us, especially as we get closer to our wedding. There are lots of events that we're invited to as a couple, whether they're parties, other weddings, or casual summer weekend get-togethers. And every time, there's a fight. Because I have learned that this is such an ordeal for him, I've tried to respect that by either going to these events by myself or forgoing them altogether. However, there are some things that I feel are important for us to attend as a couple. On one level, it seems discourteous for us to be invited as a couple and for me to regularly show up alone. My friends have started to remark upon his absence. We haven't seen him in a while. On another level, my friends are a very important network to me, and I cannot understand his distaste for spending time with them. It hurts Sugar. I know there are some of my friends who he prefers to others, but he's reluctant to attend gatherings even with those he likes. I've tried only asking him to come to small gatherings. Still no luck. I feel abandoned and betrayed. What's wrong with my friends that he doesn't want to spend time with them? They have been uniformly welcoming to him, engaging him in conversation and asking about his life and interests. Many friends have said they want to know him better. On a few occasions, my love has agreed to come to parties or events I've deemed important, but there's always a fallout. Mm. The days leading up to it are full of tension between us and short tempers, or he'll suddenly be taciturn and withdrawn. Sometimes, at the event itself, he sulks quietly, and I stand there getting angrier and angrier. What on earth can I do, Sugars? I love this man. I simply cannot understand what the issue is, and he is either unable or unwilling to articulate it. I know he's aware of how important this is to me, which is why he sometimes tries. But I'm writing this to you from behind the closed doors of the bedroom, where I've retreated after our latest spat over going less than ten minutes away to a small, quiet gathering with a friend and her family for a couple of hours. I've tried not to put pressure on him, and to only ask that he accompany me to the more important, less overwhelming events. But I'm hurt and frustrated, and I cannot understand. What's wrong with me and my friends? Signed, Social Butterfly Loves a Hermit Crab. Well, here's the thing, Social Butterfly. There might actually not be anything wrong with you or your friends. Um, and I want to share an insight. Um, actually, I want to just cite Jane Austen. Um, Sense and Sensibility is about a lot of things. Her novel, Sense and Sensibility, is her first novel. But uh, one of the things it has is one of the most beautiful, insightful descriptions of what shyness is or introversion. It's uh, the character Edward Ferrars is sort of explaining himself to this more extroverted character, Marianne. Marianne Dashwood, and he says, I never wish to offend, but I am so foolishly shy that I often seem negligent when I am only kept back by my natural awkwardness. Shyness is only the effect of a sense of inferiority in some way or other. If I could persuade myself that my manners were perfectly easy and graceful, I should not be shy. I read that to you, Social Butterfly, so that you understand that your fiancé is struggling with doubt and shame. And the reason that he can't talk about his introversion is because he feels ashamed. And he knows that you want him to be able to do this thing for him to connect to your friends and that you want him to publicly interact with you in these events that for him are probably terrifying. It's not just about being introverted. That's not simply what it is. It goes beyond that. It's not situational. It's characterological. Everything she's trying to do that's a compromise or half measure is still leading to these big fights. Yeah. I mean, there's one thing to be introverted, another to have such social anxiety that really becomes like a non-functional relationship. And I do think that there are kind of two questions at play here that we should explore. One is, you know, can this couple move forward, you know, given the fact that they have clearly incompatible desires about what kind of social life they want to have. She wants it to be one way, he wants it to be another. So one solution is that they come up with a compromise, they dig deeper, they both give a little something. The other is that they come to the conclusion that this is a deep incompatibility. You know, if, if this were a letter from somebody saying, you know, I like to have sex and my partner wants to be celibate, we, we <laughs> might say, you know, that this might not work out even if you love each other and you're compatible in all these other ways. And so, you know, I think there is this truism 
when it comes to our dealings with people, but especially I think in romantic partnerships, people change all the time. They compromise all the time, but they also stay who they are. And social butterfly is probably always going to be married to a hermit crab. So the question on the table before us today is, can these two, can this extrovert who loves social gatherings make a lifelong relationship with this introvert who hates them? Yeah. So this is complicated, isn't it, Steve? It's extremely complicated. And yeah. I'm so glad since we're both extroverts and we don't have any of these problems that we hermit crab... We do not crab. speak the language <laughs> of the introvert. So we're going to talk to somebody who just happens to be an expert on this very issue. Let's go ahead and say the expert. The expert, Susan Cain. She wrote a tremendously interesting, best-selling book called Quiet, The Power of Introverts. Both Erin and I read it, and it was revelatory in terms of me understanding her and her understanding herself. Wonderful. Well, let's give her a call. Thank you for calling the JW Marriott San Antonio Ho Country Resort and Spa. All <laughs> agents are assisting other guests at this time. We are Which having a convention of introverts. <laughs> Please go straight to voicemail. Last Scene, a new podcast from WBUR in the Boston Globe, investigates the largest unsolved art heist in history. So about the time that he begins putting the duct tape on, he says, this is a robbery. The theft of half a billion dollars worth of art from the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum in Boston. When the FBI says, we solved it, we know who did it, it's like, no, you don't, because you don't have the paintings. Subscribe and listen to Last Scene Now on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. Sponsored by Samuel Adams and ADT Smart Home. I'm Michelle Goldberg. I'm Ross Douthat. And I'm David Leonhardt. We're the hosts of The Argument, a new podcast from the New York Times opinion section. These days, it's more important than ever to listen to people who disagree with you. Maybe they'll teach you something new. Or maybe they'll just teach you how to beat them. So listen to The Argument from the New York Times. Subscribe on Apple Podcasts or wherever you like to listen. Yeah, we're back. Hello. Susan. Hi. This is Cheryl. Hi, Cheryl. How are you? We're good, but where, where are you at some spa and resort? Oh, you know, I never really know where I am, but um, <laughs> it, it's San Antonio, Texas. I just got here late last night, gave a talk that I just finished. Susan and I, we met, we're, we're on the same trail, the lecture circuit. Mm -hmm. And it's yeah. probably harder for you than for me because I'm just a big extrovert. I'm an extrovert, but I like to be alone. Oh, yeah. No, I hear that from so many people. I know. You know, and before you got on the phone, Steve and I talked about this, um, that there aren't just like two camps of people. You know, introverts are this way and extroverts are this way. I think most of us have a blend. One of the situations we've got with this letter that we're considering, the social butterfly and who's in love with the hermit crab, is it sounds like at least their self-concept is that they're on two extremes. Yeah, yeah. No, that's so true. And I mean, either maybe they really are extremes or just, you know how it always happens in couples when you have any kind of disagreement? Yeah. You, you end up polarizing each other. Right. Well, I'm glad, though, that they're asking these questions now before they Correct. seal the deal. So, Susan, what advice do you have uh, for this uh, social butterfly in love with a hermit crab? Yeah. So, okay, the first thing is um, she talks a lot in her letter about feeling hurt and abandoned mm -hmm. by her fiancé. And while that's very natural and it's a common thing that I hear from within these kinds of couples, uh, I would urge her to try to remove that from the equation and to really, truly not take it personally because it's yes. pretty clear from reading her description of what he is telling her that it has nothing to do with his dislike of her or her friends, but exactly. rather just his own feelings about being a social being or not being one in the world. Um, and my, my guess, too, is that you know she, she mentions her fiancé not really wanting to talk about her, not being able to give her an explanation that makes sense for her. Um, and my guess is that that's because he feels 
no small degree of shame yeah. about feeling shy in a social situation. I, I, you know, I, I think that most shy people feel that way in a culture that tells us that it's wrong to feel so. Um, and I think it's especially difficult for men who are told that they have to be fearless and dominant and take charge of a room when they enter it. So, you know, it's possible he's not even comfortable articulating these things to himself, let alone to her. But, uh, you know, I'm sure he's worried about losing face with his fiance, who he loves so much. Yeah, he loses face with her every time she brings it up or the the possibility of an invitation comes up. And what a great thing to note that, you know, her feelings are hurt. He knows that. He knows he's hurting her, even though she shouldn't be taking it personally, because this isn't a choice he's making. Is that right? Would you say that, Susan? Oh, yeah. I mean, yes, he could, of course, make the choice to go to all the events, notwithstanding his feelings about it, but whether or not that's the right choice, I don't know. You could just say that it's a choice. But the thing that um, is certainly not a choice is how he feels when he is at these events, which is probably, you know, a whole constellation of negative feelings ranging from boredom to discomfort to humiliation, (laughs) just excruciating discomfort, you know. Uh, And when you think about it from that point of view, it would be understandable that he is making the choice to attend as few of these as possible. What is the difference between introversion and social anxiety? Yeah, they are really different. So uh, um, introversion is about being more reactive to stimulation and therefore feeling very quickly overstimulated and therefore wanting to be in quieter settings. And going to a party is a very stimulating thing to do. You know, you're like talking to lots of people at once and reading lots of body language and facial expressions. You know, there's just a lot going on there. So even somebody who's not shy but is introverted might often just prefer not to go to the party and instead do something more mellow. But then when you add social anxiety to that, social anxiety is about the real fear of being judged in that kind of a situation. You know, I don't think we know exactly whether her fiancé is introverted or shy or both. I'm guessing it's probably a combination of the two. Hmm. The formulation that I was reading, a little quote from Jane Austen, and, and Susan, you can tell me if this is reductionistic. It probably is. But the formulation that she has is that somehow shyness, as one of her characters defines it, is sort of introversion plus shame. Oh, my goodness. Jane Austen says that? That's fantastic. Yeah, I'm breaking it down a little bit. That, you know, this guy at a party, for instance, is feeling all of those things, but he's also feeling resentful because he feels like his inferiority in those situations is being exposed. And Mm -hmm. the instrument of that exposure is his fiance. Of course, she just wants him to be happy and she wants to show him off. I mean, her motives are obviously good and pure, but wow, what an intractable conflict because he winds up feeling terrible about himself and then gets sullen and resentful even before they've gotten to the party, if they get to the party. Yeah, yeah, no, that's all really beautifully expressed. He feels that way, but she does too. I mean, I I have so much sympathy for the letter writer. I mean, here she has this partner who cannot uh, and will not and does not want to accompany her to things that we both expect and want our partners to accompany us to, right? And and she's protecting him because what she's doing, she doesn't want to face how angry and disappointed she is in him. She says, well, it must be me or my friends. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's a really good point that you made, Cheryl, about sympathy for the letter writer because it is true you know there's so many social expectations for one thing about your partner is going to accompany you to events and it's hard to flout those and then she's also a truly social person who depends for her happiness you saying and to combat depression um, on being social so it's really tricky i do have a thought of how they might try to work this problem out once they actually come to truly understand each other instead of looking at each other through a kind of scram of resentment. Right. How might they get that, do you think? Let's back up first and say, do we have some advice about how they can come to a clearer understanding of each other's needs and and not make them personal, but rather really understand the other for who they are? I think they might each try to verbalize what they think the other is truly feeling Mm -hmm. at these moments and say, okay, we're going to go through an exercise where we are assuming each person is acting with the best of intentions. Now, why are you acting the way you are? Mm -hmm. I think it's because fill in the blanks. I actually have an entire chapter of my book, Quiet, where I talk about introvert, extrovert couples 
and the various conflicts that they have to navigate. And the number one conflict that I found through my research and wrote about in that chapter is this very one. You know, the question yeah. of how much to socialize. Uh, I, I hear it all the time from people. Yeah, well, it's really striking that this situation that the letter writer, Social Butterfly, she feels so alone in it, that in fact, it's a very common problem or conundrum that couples face. Because introverts and extroverts are so often attracted to each other because, you know, they really complement each other in so many ways. Um, but of course, when you're dealing with someone who compliments you, that means they're not like you. And, and, uh, and this happens to be like the number one manifestation of that. So, Susan, one of the things that my wife and I are, are both big fans of yours and read Quiet in part because we're one of these mixed marriages that you're talking about. Um, and one of the things that I so appreciated that I want to uh, try to uh, make Social Butterfly aware of, because I think it's part of what makes your book so special and the reason it's resonated with a lot of people, is you're talking about something in terms of introversion versus extroversion that doesn't just play out in personal relationships. It also plays out in the culture at large. And one of the concepts that I was so fascinated by is the historiography that you go through where you know, in the 19th century in America, there was something called the uh, culture of character, right? Yeah. Where what determined our sense of worth was really played out in private. It wasn't performative. And as you saw late model capitalism do its thing, we became and have become increasingly, and I think the internet has only sent this into warp speed, a performative culture where there is this constant expectation that what gives you value is how you come off in public and how well you perform, whether that's job networking or even to some extent all of the parties that now have to accompany a couple into being married. It's a fundamental shift in the culture that I think you address in a way that nobody else had yet. And I think it's something that is a bigger, larger cultural force that's impinging on this guy in particular and couples like this. Yes, I think that is exactly, exactly right. And, um, you know, in the older days when we still lived in the so-called culture of character, there were more socially desirable models of how to behave that were available to shy or introverted men, because um, the, the idea of kind of the strong, silent type, who was a man of quiet integrity, was a much more prominent model of being in our culture. I think the good news is that that model is still alive and well, and I'm guessing there is some aspect of that in Hermit Crab that Social Butterfly is attracted to. That's right. You know, if you look at the way she describes him, he, he sounds like a really good, strong guy who's caring and has great principles. And she, makes her crazy happy. That's and he, right. And, and he's funny. And part of what she's probably saying is, you're this incredible person. I feel this way about Aaron all the time. Like, I want you to take all of your wit and your compassion and your empathy and everything that I see all the time you know, I want my friends to see that. I want to show you off. I want that person to be in a public setting. And what Social Butterfly probably needs to recognize is that's, at the moment, very difficult for him. Yeah. So, Susan, once they have that understanding, or at least come to a place where they're talking a little more openly with each other and less defensively, what advice do you have for them? How, you know, how do couples with this kind of incompatibility make it work? Well. They really need to negotiate in advance yes. an agreement yes. as to how many social engagements they are going to do per week, per month, per year, uh, per major life event. Not all social events are created alike, and there may be some that he's more comfortable with than others, so they should talk about that. Um, they should talk about once they're at the social event, what, what is the way of navigating the social event that's most comfortable for him? For some people, they would love to have their spouse by their side, and other people, would that would make them feel self-conscious. So you can't know unless you start to be able to have this discussion in a very open way and then just stick to that. Because it sounds, from reading Social Butterfly's letter, as if they are getting into an argument each and every time. Every time. Like each one has to be fought anew, as if they were fighting it for the first time. Yeah. And, you know, and if he knows that... She's not going to be asking him to go to every event, and, and rather they're going to go to the number that they've worked out. Um, let's say it's one a week or one every two weeks or whatever it is. Um, she described him as sulking. I think he won't feel that way. It's just 
they'll be doing it within agreed upon parameters. Yeah. And the reason I, I I recommend like going through that process of talking about all this and trying to negotiate it out in advance is then I think they'll have a better chance at having a clear idea of okay, even in its best version, is this something I want to live with or right. or can I just not do it? Yeah. Right. I mean it's one thing but it's one big thing that's going to repeat itself all throughout their lives. True. You know, it's a big deal. I think that when I read this letter, I was really concerned about their compatibility. I do think that people can work around this, but, the, you know, it, it, it isn't easy to be in a long-term partnership um, when there is such a, a sort of a deep divide between your preferences. And many, many marriages have succeeded in spite of those differences and, and in some ways thrived because of them, and many have failed. And so I think it's a really great idea, Social Butterfly, for you and Hermit Crab to really address this deeply before yes. you make that vow to marry each other. That's right. Does this strike you, having read this letter and thought about it from Social Butterfly, as a, a couple that um, is, is extreme on the spectrum or where there's the possibility that this really might be too much of an incompatibility? You know, I think we don't know enough yet to say right. because it seems to me that right now they're so mired in not fully understanding where the other one is coming from, right. that it might be that that lack of understanding is kind of um, polarizing their positions, as often happens within couples. So I think we can't really know yet. Um, but, like, you know, if it really is true that she you know, really wants to go out all the time and he really never, ever does, um, that starts to sound more extreme. But I wonder if that's really true. Right, yeah. right. I will say one thing. I was really encouraged, and I think Social Butterfly, you've done great work in this regard is she does say, look, I don't ask him to go to everything with me. I try to pick and choose the ones that are really important. And I that's think that true. that's, you know, I think what I mean by that is she does have some consciousness about that. Of course. She's yep. not writing to us and saying, what's wrong with this guy? Yeah. He just wants to sit on the couch. Right? Yeah. yeah. No, that's true. I think what people sometimes don't see, though, is kind of like um, how wildly different perspectives can be. Because yes. I'm just thinking as we're talking about this, of how I actually got married under a tree. <laughs> so it was my husband, it was me, and it was two of our dearest friends who functioned as witnesses. And that was what we did. And it was one of the most joyful days in my life. Wow. Um, so, you know, you compare that to like the whole different series of events. Yeah. There's just so much, so much variety of human experience. Right. Yeah, I think that most of us who are married or in long-term partnerships uh, will say that, you know, that thing that annoyed you about your partner, you know, in the early days, it, it usually doesn't go away. It's yeah. usually that no, thing that not. will continue to be, you know, the flaw that you see in their character or the, or the place where you're not as compatible with them as maybe you wish you were. Um, and, you know, so I think you do need to come to terms with that and say, now, is this is this a level of incompatibility that I can deal with? Or am I going to be really angry in 30 years at this partner who didn't go to every wedding and potluck with me? Yeah. And for Hermit Crab, like, am I going to be angry that I was harassed all these years to do these things I didn't want to do? Right. Um, neither one of yeah. them is right or wrong. They each have their lives. And so, you know, are they willing to carry the burden of that disappointment? I think that is a really... Good point. Um, and just as we were saying earlier, to try to remove the shame from the discussion of temperamental differences, to also remove the shame from the personal questioning that this couple should now go through. And if they do decide, you know what, this doesn't work, we're too incompatible, there's no shame in that. There's actually a great integrity in figuring that out now exactly. and making the right decision. Yeah. One thing that unsettled me in the letter is that Social Butterfly talks about how Hermit Crab's uh, group of close friends that sort of he's had these friends since childhood and some work colleagues he's close to, but he has no new friends that he's really connected with. And most of his childhood friends have, have moved out of state. Um, and I wondered about that just in the sense of the amount of pressure that's on the relationship. In other words, is that an issue of concern that you see, you know, in couples where one member is is quite introverted that there's extra pressure because really the, the spouse is his entire or her entire social life or most of his or her social life well i mean 
I suppose it could be, but at least from what we know from the letter, which of course is limited, it doesn't sound as if he's putting pressure on her to be his everything. Mm-hmm. It sounds more just that he doesn't want to go with her to her events. Right. So, you know, I, I think there are a lot of people um, who are completely comfortable to have one or two friends around and have their childhood friends who they chat with every so often, and that's fine. Um, there's nowhere that it's written that you have to have a big merry band of friends nearby and at hand all the time, as long as that's what you're happy with, and it might be that he really is. I had no idea it wasn't written anywhere. I've been living <laughs> under that impression. Because <laughs> <'cause> we're extroverts. <laughs> well, Susan, really, what an honor to talk to you. I think that you're awesome, and you gave us some great insight and wisdom in this conversation. And I hope that, that Social Butterfly, you're listening to this, and go out and get Susan's book, Quiet, if you haven't already. I think it will be really informative uh, you know, for both you and your partner to read together as you g- explore this question. Yeah, thanks so much, uh, Susan. Thank you so much. I love talking to you both. That was kind of awesome. I I really have just one more thing I want to say to Social Butterfly. It seems to me that what we're circling around is that Social Butterfly, you have a really precious opportunity here. You're going to have to intrude gently upon the privacy of your husband's character a little bit. Fiance. Did I say husband? (laughs) Yes. I was being hopeful. But, you know, it's true. Fiance. And The truth is that's a precious opportunity because there's a part of him that he hasn't revealed to you yet, but you need to know it to understand how he sees the world, how he sees this extreme situation. He really does get worked up at every possibility that he's going to have to be at a party, but there's a reason for that. And she has the opportunity and he's got a consent to let her know how it feels and what's going on inside of him. And unfortunately, that opportunity to know him better is also carries a profound risk, Mm -hmm. which is the one we've sort of been rushing up against, that he will say, either I cannot articulate this and I refuse to, this is just how I am, or that he'll tell her, I find this excruciating, and she'll realize that it's more complicated. I think they can manage it, because I think she loves him like crazy, and I think he loves her like crazy. Mm -hmm. But he has got to, and she has 